Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English A, room 303, and we now turn to Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. I'm with you on page 617. Let's begin on page 617 by just looking at some background information. Do you see it on the bottom of the page there? Read it with me. Swift recognized that the best audience for A Modest Proposal was the upper class. Let's write this down. The upper class, notice a group of people who had the ability to make changes for the better in Ireland. On a satirical level, however, Swift's essay mocks this very group of people. He suggests that their relentless pursuit of luxury has developed in them a taste for almost unimaginable delicacies. In this way, they become the perfect target for his modest Proposal. Now, let's make three observations as we begin our reading and close line-by-line -line study of this text. One, Swift is born in Ireland of English parents and will always have a love for Ireland. He has some serious problems with a number of the issues that are political in nature. England has certain kinds of legal and law types of legislation in place that is hurting immensely the Irish people. They are suffering from starvation. They are suffering from any number of other poverty-related issues. And when Swift has traveled in Ireland, he comes back to England recognizing there are serious problems in Ireland. He is going to argue in this essay, there's roughly 100 to 150,000, 120,000 uh, children every year that no one really wants in Ireland, and these children are in need of help. So Swift wants to help them. His proposal then will be a piece of satire. Now let's write this down to be second observation. Swift's satire. We have mentioned before two types of satire when we, for example, studied Chaucer and when we studied Swift's um, uh, Gulliver's Travels. We mentioned that there's two kinds of satire. There's what we call Horatian satire, which is kind of funny, soft satire. If, for example, your friend makes fun of you in front of your pals and you kind of laugh along, that is Horatian satire. But the second kind of satire is Juvenilian satire, coming from the great Roman writer Juvenal. And this kind of satire is nasty, biting satire. Let's point out that Modest Proposal is the classic example of Juvenilian satire. In other words, no one is going to think that this is funny. Unless you have a really twisted sense of you know, humor, you would maybe see this as funny. Most everybody else will not. Certainly, American colonists who will be referenced in this essay did not think it was funny at all. When we get to that part of the essay, we'll point it out. Finally, number three. We have said this before in our study of Swift in terms of Gulliver's Travels. We'll say it again now. Swift is what we will call a moralist. His religious background is going to incline him this way, and he definitely is writing to try to change people's opinions and people's actions. The irony, of course, is that he needs to have the very upper class of England helping him to be able to effect a change in Ireland. At the same time, it will be this very upper class that he will be attacking. Notice that picture on page 617. There's any number of observations about this called the midday meal. Obviously, in this painting, if you look at it really quickly on 617, you can see very wealthy, upper-class people eating a heavy meal in the middle of the day. Of course, if you are a person starving to death, living outside the mansion that this painting is portraying, obviously, you're going to have a certain view of these people who live this really kind of cultured, upper-class. Notice, for example, the gloves just randomly tossed onto the uh, little cushion there. It shows a certain attitude of kind of almost cavalierness. In other words, wealthy people can afford to just kind of be very cavalier with their meals, with their clothing, and the way that they relax as they eat, right? Obviously, Swift is going to have problems with people just like this as he then attacks what he sees as a serious problem in Ireland. Notice on page 618, the second title. If the first title is Modest Proposal, the second title is there for you at the top of 618. For preventing the children 
of poor people from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. Now, I think there's a number of reasons why Modest Proposal continues to be read today, especially at university. I will make some observations at the end of our time here about why that is the case. Let's now read the essay itself, one of the greatest single pieces of satire and satiric writing that you can find. And let's begin to try and do some annotative work, first at level one, where we are simply summarizing, then at level 2A, where we are finding themes and messages, then at level 2B, that is to say the rhetorical level of reading, not what the author says, but how the author says it, pointing out, for example, this is a work of satire, would be a 2B observation. And then finally at level 3, as we relate to this text, it is, I'm reading now with you on page 618, it is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town, that is to say Dublin, the great town of Ireland, or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags, and importuning every passenger for an alms, that is to say, some handout of a kind. Let's just begin with the very first sentence and write it down in our notes at level one. Swift says, when you go through the streets of Dublin, Ireland, you see terrible poverty, children, bunches of children being born, and no one is taking care of these children. Obviously, it goes without saying that when he uses the word melancholy in the first line, what he is saying is, this is bad form. This is bad in every way. Let's look at the next line. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work, or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. In other words, sad, he says, the mothers of these children, they, she, they have so many of these children, can't afford to take care of them, and so the mothers have to walk the streets of Dublin and beg for food. When the children grow up, sad to say, they either turn into thieves because they can't find any work, or they will leave and go fight outside of uh, the, the, England, the, the United Kingdom, um, uh, on the side of Spain, or they will sell themselves or be sold into slavery. In other words, the opening paragraph sets up the essay, and let's reduce it to one line. Things are bad in Ireland for especially the children. Children, it seems, always suffer the most when poverty is at play, and he says it's really bad. Notice the second paragraph. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious, large, number of children in the arms or on the backs or at the heels of their mothers and frequently of their fathers is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. It will be darkly ironic, this paragraph, once we figure out what his proposal will be for all these unwanted children. But let's just point out what he says at level one really quickly. He says, if anybody could come up with a plan that could make these children useful to the commonwealth, that is to say the United Kingdom, then there ought to be a huge statue built for him in downtown London. Up to this point, the audience that will be reading this essay, namely English upper class, would be saying, hear, hear, you're absolutely right. It's terrible, all these poor children running the streets like young beggars in Dublin, Ireland. And if anybody could figure out a way to solve this problem, you are absolutely right, we ought to build them a statue in the middle of town. Third paragraph. But my intention is far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent and shall take in the whole, uh, in, in the whole number of infants at a certain age who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them as those who demand our charity in the streets. In other words, he says, my proposal is going to be good, level one, let's write it down. My proposal is going to be good not only for the children, but as well for their parents and by extension for the commonwealth as well. In other words, he says, I have a scheme, a grand plan. It is the title, 
modest. That means humble. Nobody's going to be offended. And of course, a proposal means a plan. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject and maturely weighed the several schemes of other projectors, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. In other words, he says, when I've listened to other people write about this, let's just pause for a moment. Uh, we, we've said this before about compositional approach. There's two ways, basically, to get into the house of a composition. One is through the front door. This is what we call that linear approach, where you say, my thesis is blah, blah, blah. The second is through the back door. That is to say, no one sees it coming. This is satire. This is that approach that never you never see the large softball aluminum bat coming right at your face, metaphorically speaking. And here, notice he says, I've read a whole lot of essays about how terrible it is in Ireland with all these children and the terrible poverty and all of that. He says, however, something is wrong in the papers that I've read. In the, th in the essays that I've read. Something about the mathematics. Now let's put it in our notes now at 2B. In this essay, Swift will take the persona, we used the term earlier in Gulliver's Travels discussion of a mask, the persona of an accountant. Someone who is just interested in the facts, someone who is just interested in the numbers. And he says about the computation, I'm a little bit concerned that I don't think it's quite on. Now we'll keep reading. It is true, a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a solar year with little other nourishment, at most not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner as indeed of being a charge upon their parents or the parish or wanting food and raiment, raiment is clothing, for the rest of their lives, they shall on the contrary contribute to to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. Again, up to this point, any reader of this would say, whoa, great, you got a solution that says up to one year old, the mother can take care of her children on her own by simply breastfeeding them. But after one year old, now you got to begin to provide actual food for the child. Obviously, the mother can't do that. She's too poor. Therefore, I've got a solution to the problem. At one year old, we are going to be able to solve the problem of all the starving children, but even better, we're going to be able to solve the problem for the entire nation about all these kids. As a matter of fact, go back and look at it again at the very last line. We are hoping to contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands of adults. Whoa, again, up to this point, right? You've got all kinds of interesting kinds of setup going on. For example, in your reading strategy, right to the left there, do you see it? Read it with me, analyzing text features. How does Swift's use of the word damn, explained, of course, in your footnotes, right, as a female parent, usually an animal, right, indicate the irony behind his proposal? In other words, how does what he actually says differ from what he really means? He calls them mothers of these children, these poor children, dams, which is to say what we would call an animal mother, right? Okay, like for example, a cow. What is going on ironically here? Notice this is completely impersonal. Let's write this down in our notes. Very impersonal. He is simply saying these people are like animals and I'm going to talk about them as if they're animals. In other words, as he begins his computations, it will sound very much like he's talking about goats or sheep or cows. Of course, this is going to be part of the satire, right? In other words, everyone knows this is happening and no one is doing anything about it. As a matter of fact, England continues, Swift is going to argue, continues to enforce laws that are causing a lot of this poverty in Ireland. There is, last lines on 618, there is likewise another great advantage in my scheme that it will prevent those voluntary abortions and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children, alas, too frequent among us, sacrificing the poor innocent babes, I doubt, more to avoid the expense than the shame which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast. In other words, he says it's really terrible. People are having children, and they don't want the children. Oftentimes they are aborting the children, which Swift, which Swift will argue is a terrible moral uh, crime. He says my proposal will solve that problem as well. Let's just point out that in this satiric approach, the first thing Swift does is to set up the problem. 
Notice he has not told us what his proposal is yet. We want to write this down at level 2B. He has not told us what his proposal is yet. He simply told us what his proposal is good for. It's almost like good advertising today where we might, on, in the advertisement notice, they'll talk about all the great advantages to some product before they actually mention what the product is. Getting the attention then of the readers. Let's keep going. First paragraph indention on page 619. The number of souls in this kingdom, being usually reckoned one million and a half, uh, uh, your footnote will tell you the census from the year 1699 put Ireland's population at about 1.2 uh, million people. The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about 200,000 couple whose wives are breeders from which number I subtract 30,000 couples who are able to maintain their own children, although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distress of the kingdom, but this being granted, there will remain 170,000 breeders. Notice again the use of the word breeders instead of mothers. I again subtract 50,000 for those women who miscarry or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain 120,000 children of poor parents annually born so let's write it down at level one after all of his mathematics again sounding very much like an accountant he says basically we got 120,000 kids every year nobody wants what are you going to do with those children the question notice this notice the colon the question therefore is and here it is finally this is the question of his proposal how this number shall be reared and provided for, which as I have already said under the present situation of affairs is utterly impossible by all the methods here to propose, for we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture, we neither build houses, I mean in the country, nor cultivate land, they can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing till they arrive at six years old, except where they are of, tw of towardly parts, in other words, if they've, you know, highly talented, right? Although I confess they learn the root much earlier during which time they can however be properly looked upon only as probationers as I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the country of Caven who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six even in a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art in other words a long way to say absolutely no good comes of this hundred and twenty thousand kids every year Nothing they could do. Notice the irony. By the, they, they can't do really very, they can't even be good, very good thieves until after the age of six. Although he says, I gotta be honest, he said, I've been hearing more and more that they're getting better at a younger and younger age of being thieves. Note the dark irony here. In other words, 120,000 kids that are born, nobody wants them, nobody wants to take care of them. He says, I've got a solution. Now he's ready to move into his solution. You can kind of think of this essay as a two-part essay. Part one, we got a problem. Part two, let's solve the problem. It will be the solution, this proposal, this modest proposal, that will, of course, attract serious, serious concern on the number of people. As a matter of fact, a number of years ago, I got a phone call from a mother. I didn't realize it, but she had been helping her daughter every evening do her homework by reading aloud with her because her daughter struggled as a reader. A wonderful thing for a parent to do if the young person is struggling as a reader. But now she was very upset and she called me up and she said, you've crossed the line this time, Mr. McGee. A number of the readings you've been assigning to my daughter, no question or controversial, but I can see their academic merit, but this? Modest proposal, you've crossed the line, I'm ready to take you to the school board and require you to defend that you would ever assign such, such an essay. Well, in heaven's name, why could she have been so offended? Well, to this point in our study, we haven't seen anything really that offensive other than the fact that Swift's persona of an accountant talks about these poor women as if, notice, they are breeders dams instead of really human beings will now turn to what maybe had offended I'm speaking now ironically maybe offended my mother who had called me let's take a look I am assured line uh, page 619 I am assured by our merchants that a boy or girl before 12 years old is no saleable commodity 
And even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds or three pounds and half a crown at most on the exchange, which cannot turn to account either to the parents or the kingdom, the charge of nutriment and rags having been at least four times that value. In other words, he says, a, a boy or a girl of 12 years old is of little value. Okay, you can't do much with them in terms of a commodity, right? I shall now, therefore, he uses the word humbly, just like in his title, propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. We, of course, have to write down at 3a our relations to other texts, Chaucer's final lines. Remember them when we studied them in the general prologue when he said, I hope I don't offend anyone, right? We know full well that Swift is being very ironic here when he says, I'm going to offer my proposal and I hope I don't upset anybody. I hope I don't offend anybody. Of course, this is just pure irony. Say one thing and mean something else. Now, of course, these next lines, woo, right? The, the um, colonialists and the Americans and the American colonies, deeply unhappy about the next line. Read it with me. You can understand why the minute you read it. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricus or a ragged. Now, whoa, 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 what did you just read? Let's make sure we have it in our notes at level one, and let's point out at level two B where the idea comes from. Swift will say, an American told me that over there across the Atlantic, right, they love to eat their children. And they'll eat their children in any number of ways. Notice the way he lists it. You can stew them. You can roast them. You can bake them. Now let's point out something brilliant about Swift here that's very subtle at 2B. Notice he is not actually saying this is his plan. 